but life doesn't stop, right? Like nobody cares that, oh, you're a startup founder or an artist or you're writing a book. I had never been as vulnerable as a startup founder in the past four years as I was now with my, you know, dad dying and then passing. Great things are greater than anybody. Yeah. Nobody is great enough to do them. I am at best a co-creator, a co-investigator. Every boss after two years of running a company with employees should be given a PhD in social psychology. Our generation is characterized by intellectual orphans. A member of the audience has a better idea than you, and we believe that you benefit the most of all people present to find out. Most people, when they're listening to other people, they're really not listening, and what they are doing is thinking about how they're going to respond. A good thing about conversations is it doesn't exist. We create it every second of the way. Anyway, so we digress. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loop. So today I have one of my very favorite people as my guest, Anna Gatt, who, I mean, like, Anna, I don't even, I run out of superlatives for you. You are an entrepreneur. You are a great thinker. You are single-handedly trying to bring the idea that dominated the centuries of conversations and interactions, the salon, back into the internet age. And you also are looking for the good internet, which I love. Disclosures, uh, O'Shaughnessy Ventures is an investor in inter intellect. Also, full disclosure, Anna is one of the members of the O'Shaughnessy uh, Ventures Advisory Council, and we are very lucky to have her. Anna, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for uh, for having me back. I think I'm. I, this is my first return to Inside Loops, so I can attest to it being true to its name. <laughs> That's right. Here's the we loop. Were well, we we were talking before we started to record about the fact that unfortunately you just lost your dad. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned like losing my mom when I was very young and trying to build a business. Uh, and you, you really, it's one of those things that I learned at least, and I want to get your view that I, even though I thought I was ready for it, I wasn't mm -hmm. really ready for it and mm -hmm. trying to do grieve my mother, who I was incredibly close to while really starting my first company in earnest. Wow, that was tough. How about you? Well, it's it's a ride. Um, it came unexpectedly, um, and I don't think you're ever ready for it. It's one of the great built-in rites of passage in human life. Um, you know, it's a, a not an if, but a when kind of question. Um, I remember the morning I woke up, uh, I think it was the 10th of March, um, and I saw this mess. The, the night before, I started seeing that people were trying to send me messages on Messenger. People were sending me message requests. Um, and my uh, my parents are public people. And whenever this happens, I know it's journalists. So I remember going to bed. It was a uh, Saturday uh, a couple of weeks ago, feeling a bit queasy about this. Like something is, you know, looming on the horizon. Um, and I slept terribly. I had nightmares. I, I, I woke, you know, um, after four hours of sleep. Um, and then I open my phone and I see this message from a friend and I knew exactly, I think your buddy knows this is not a drill. This is today. And I remember I made myself coffee, poured some wusa, opened the airline website flight. And then I called my friend to hear the details because you know it, you know, it's why it's the day. Um, and you know, it kind of parachutes you into a new territory that's your home from now on it's the new state stage of the game um and you have to you know withstand it right in a way that is not self-destructive or harmful to other people um we run companies we build projects i think we will build the world um as a living um but life it doesn't stop right like nobody cares that, oh, you're a startup founder or an artist or you're writing a book, uh, things just keep happening and and you have to find these balances to make it work. Um, 
I like to say that in my 20s, I didn't understand what was happening. I kept, you know, I read so much fiction. I was trying to understand how people work because it was completely confusing to me. I had strong emotions and physical reactions about things, but I didn't really understand the logic, you know? Um, and my 30s, it felt like, I, I like to say that your 30s um, are about seeing that the vase is about to fall, but you can't catch it yet. So you have this, you know, premonition or, 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 or you know, prescient uh, uh, feeling all the time, but there, you don't have the knowledge or the wisdom or the experience yet to really steer the world. I think people who manage to do it are either extremely precautious or they do it by accident or it's a post hoc, uh, you know, interpretation of their actions. Um, and I turned 40 recently and told myself that my 40s are going to be about catching the vase. And one way that I thought this was going to happen was through me always speaking the truth whenever it's possible in an active way. So not just not responding, you know, truthfully, but also starting with truth, even if it's uncomfortable, because I intuited that it's very, very closely related to the ability to catch the bus. You have to openly show that you want to catch it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I've been an immigrant for over 10 years and a lot of it was very, very difficult. You know, my family is not at all a Rose Garden kind of TV sitcom family. Um, and it's like the 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 depths of Eastern European show business with everything you can imagine. Um, and I, you know, as an immigrant, I had this recurring fear every morning I would wake up for the past decade that I would open my phone and somebody would tell me that my dad died. Like I saw this, there's a, there's a website, um, a, a news website in Hungary that's very, um, I'm Hungarian originally from Budapest. Um, I left a long time ago. Um, there's this website called Index where I, I, I visualized this headline that Meghod Gat Gyerd, Gat Gyerd, my dad has died. Um, and, and I remember I, I flew home after six years. I hadn't been home for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I went to see my dad. I got three days left with him. So it was the timing, you know, um, was, um, was at least a little bit flexible uh, for me. Um, and I, you know, I, I was there, I was with him a couple of minutes before he, he died. Um, and then on the night, uh, I, you know, I, I, I found out that uh, after I had left, um, he had passed away. Um, and my friends took me out, kind of full care, love, community, support, um, you know, levels of which are hard to imagine on a normal day. Um, everybody, you know, came out uh, for me and, and it was absolutely incredible. Um, and I, I look at my phone at a moment um, uh, that night and I see the, the headline. It says, Mekhod Gadjurd, Gadjurd has died, announced his daughter. Mm. And wow. I sat there and I thought that I had, I had caught the buzz. Yeah, I love, I love that, catching the buzz. Um, I, I, my mom died pre-social media, pre-internet, uh, 1989, but I had a very similar experience. I, as I mentioned, I'd started my first company, Oshawasi Capital Management, and I had a, a very small office and was kind of beavering away there, but I would always- I have your at... book here. I know this story. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I- I like you. Uh, we, uh, my mom's death was not uh, a surprise. She yeah. had conquered lots of illnesses like lupus and and others, uh, but uh, they'd really weakened her. And so, everyone in the family knew that she was going to die. But I remember just staring at the phone and knowing, like the call is coming. Yeah, and that. That is such a, I was 28 at the time and I was very close to her as well. And so like that feeling was so alien to me when it first hit me. Like, so I was young, right? As you point out, like in your twenties, like, what do you know? Yeah. You know. <laughs> but yeah. I did know that. I did know that. I did know when the phone rang that last time, it wasn't that she had died. I was there when she died, uh, but it was come now. Yeah. And, and yeah. the other thing that you, that and you then mentioned. you have to go, right. You have to, 
I mean, I, I was once in, in this apartment in London and the, the apartment twice removed from us on the floor caught fire and actually completely burned down. And that was a similar moment when you know it's now. And you know what you need to, you, you, you know, I, I went for my passport, my, my uh, uh, laptops, my laptop cables, a coat, a bottle of water, and you go to the street. And you, there is something, I, I was joking, it's the Jewish thing, like I know how to flee. Um, but I think everybody does, you know, you, you know it's now and that this is not a drill. And you also know what, what I learned there when there was this fire. And by the way, nothing from our house uh, or our uh, apartment um, got in any way affected. Um, like there, there was a playground in front of the building. So you always heard screams, you know, like children playing. And there was this very interesting moment. You know, I was sick. I had just taken um, some doozy uh, throat medicine. I was watching some TV series on, on my bed. Um, and you hear the screams, screams, screams all day. It's completely fine. It's life, children, happiness. And that you know when it's not that scream. You know, like, the animal is wise. And you sit up and you're like, there is a fire. Or somebody got shot. And now we need to ensure that everybody's safe. Um, and I think this is how the body reacts when you get the call. You just go. Totally. Uh, we are actually working on a project with uh, uh, the scientist Rupert Sheldrake uh, to to test that because we all experience it. Every human I've ever talked to has experienced the back of the hairs on the back of your neck standing up, and just like you say, mm. some, uh, we we yeah. intuitively know. Something dramatic has changed. Yeah. And we and would how love do you to respond, right? It's like a personality test. For me, it's determination. Like I'm going to solve this. That's and then a... on, I I lose my, you know, I I I I might chicken out later. There there might be a more nuanced set of feelings later, but my first thought is to face it. Yes. And I don't normally, that, you know, live my normal life every day. I want to face everything uh, that would be metabolically incredibly expensive. Um, but when you know, you know, right? Exactly. And uh, I, I unfortunately lost a sister when I was just 10. And uh, that uh, a, a psychologist later told me that that was the end of my youth. Yeah. And like seeing that was or it suddenly made sense, right? L life can only, uh, what is it, Kierkegaard? Life can only be understood backwards, but we must live it forwards. Yeah. Um, and, and life is like, life is like a, a dinner party where you have to cook endless courses of food for your guest, but at some point, the dinner is over and you never know in advance. So all you can do is, you know, prepare and do your best <laughs> with all the dishes Ish. Entertain, keep everybody happy, and that some after one of the the courses, um, the curtains go down. Yeah, but I my, I responded exactly like you responded. My my first impulse whenever anything bad happens is always okay. How do I solve this? And eldest you know, child syndrome is how I call this. I I have a I have a theory that there should be um, an eldest child retreat where we can go once a year. Um, there are group chant exercises. This is not your responsibility. Um, whenever you feel like you have to do something, you have to do a shot. Um, and generally, it's all about relaxation, yoga, and you're not allowed. You, you get electrocuted if you, the thought passes your head that I could do this camp better. <laughs> if you think that, you're kicked out. <laughs> and I do think that there's money in this because elders yeah. children have a lot of money, Jim. So you know we can we can go to a retreat. Uh, there you go, and and that's a great illustration of of you, Anna. You immediately uh, we're talking about like I want to invest <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but there are these yeah. telltale signs. I remember I was once having a conversation with Balaji Srinivasan, who's uh, an investor in Interns Act, a good friend of mine. And we were talking about USDC, and he said this sentence, I remember, like, it works because I built it. And I was like, hey, by any chance, do you have younger siblings? <laughs> Tell me about your family. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you let, let's have to let, do it for it to work properly. Do you, do you feel that? <laughs> do you live your life living that? Um, yeah. 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 
let's chat a bit about let's keep going with that idea though because i yeah. you are you are a font of incredibly good ideas and we were chatting uh remember about the fact that kind of ted talks when, when i was uh like in my early 40s uh, yeah. i left uh bear stearns uh and and re-established my own independent asset management company and the president of my company o'shaughnessy asset management is one goal was Jim, we got to get you a TED talk. We got to get you a TED talk. We got to get you a and TED it, talk. And I'm like, okay. But yeah. and thinking about it, and we were chatting about it back then, like that was the pinnacle. The pinnacle was, wow, you got a TED talk. And then it's my opinion. So this is just an opinion, and I could be wrong, but TED kind of wrecked their brand by extending it too far, right? So, so TED, uh, you know, Des Moines. Ted, um, uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. And, and yet you sparked on that and you were like, wow, that there was, a, those were really powerful. We should, we should maybe try to recreate those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're doing long form salons. Any thoughts about changing to, you know, kind of the, the next, uh, Ted Empress? It can be a bit tricky comparing TED and Interintellect because they come from very, very different places uh, and respond to very different um, ideas about culture. Um, I think TED is extremely valuable and it serves a, you know, a layer of life and the generation or, or multiple generations extremely well. Um, but it comes from a place, from an understanding of the world that is characterized by tribes. So say the tribe of neuroscientists is sending this smart gal or guy to the stage. The San Franciscan innovators are sending this person. The Harvard religious scholars tribe is sending this person. What Indrens that came out of is that this world we think is gone. There are no such tribes anymore. Um, the exploration has completely changed. Um, politically, in terms of media, empires, our generation is characterized by intellectual orphans, people with no tribes whatsoever. Even if on paper, on their CVs, you would think, oh, this person belongs here or there. If you zoom in, you realize that's very complicated, not at all so you know, clear-cut um, uh, as it used to be. Um, and intellectual orphans have extremely different needs of companionship, intellectual fun, monetization, um, how flat or um, hierarchical they want these conversations to be. So Salon is a far less hierarchical way um, to play with ideas, right? Ted says ideas worth, 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 worth spreading. Um, we say, we don't know. Um, let's, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's so uh, telling. Because what I love about uh, the salons is that's exactly right. They are conversations. Yeah. They are not soliloquies, right? Maybe one of my member of the audience has a better idea than you. And we believe that you benefit the most of all people present to find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I wonder whether a format like uh, inviting someone to give a Ted like yeah. little whatever 15 18 minute uh soliloquy about something but then immediately starting the conversation from that that might be fun what do you think i love it and actually so we tell interact hosts using our platform to go crazy right if you want to call it a talk you can give a talk some people give workshops some people do vocal exercises some people sit around and read a book together for seven hours you know it's for as long as it fits um, the the ethos of interinslack, which we discussed last time when I was in the podcast, um, be my guest. Um, and I think that's that flexibility of trusting both the audience and the host um, to be adults and focus on the core values of gathering. Uh, but other than that, if you want to do a 10-minute song, you can do that. If you want to do a four-hour per day salon for two weeks and charge people $5,000, you can do that. Like there's nothing on our platform that stops you from doing it. And we see a lot of, for me, the, the more experimental hosts we have, 
um, the, the, the wider it will become because people, you know, learn from each other's experiences. Yeah. And your ability to iterate and have that flexibility is always something I admire. Let's yeah. get to a, let's get to the art of conversation. That's another thing that I love about you. Uh, you know, most people don't really know how to have a conversation. Most people, when they're listening to other people, they're really not listening. And what they are doing is thinking about how they're going to respond. And, and that is not active listening to me. And, and you are such a, a incredible conversationalist. What kind of, what kind of tips would you give our listeners and viewers to become better at that art? Well, thank you for saying that. I'm not sure everybody in my life would agree that I'm a good conversationalist. Um, I tend to be very extreme. Either I have nothing to say to somebody or a lot. <laughs> there are, there's no in between for me. Um, I took uh, the big five and it told me that I was f- exactly 50%, 50, 000, introverted, extroverted. So I have an ambivert, of, uh, an ambivert. Yeah. Ambiverts okay. Are completely in the middle, um, which might be, you know, needed for, be- for, for building something, um, like I'm building, when we have a very, very famous guest, um, we call these salons super salons because that's what usually you, uh, when you join a salon, that's how, how you uh, join your special guest. You are not the host. You're not responsible for the venue or the Zoom link or the logistics. You just show up and be yourself and everybody's very happy. Um, so what we advise hosts to to do when as they, are, they handle this situation where the audience might be a little bit starstruck. And what you want is you want to lower everybody's stress in the room. You know, I like to say that as opposed to TED Talks, um, the teachers of old used to sit down with people, Buddha, Jesus, Socrates, right? One of the guests at the wedding. Um, The host is hierarchical situation already. You don't have to put this person on the stage. You don't have to put light on him or her and everybody else is sitting in the darkness because the human animal knows who's guiding and, and keeping the peace at this conversation, at this gathering, and will respect this person, right? So what you want is you want to low, like close this delta a little bit. Um, nobody wants to really have a conversation guided by a perfect, all-knowing person. You might want to watch it on a video whilst you're cleaning your house in your sweatpants, but you don't want to expose your not knowing to this person because it's not a it's not first of all you're not going to learn much if it's not two ways um and it's just not a pleasant experience um so we try to close this delta and we always advise hosts to do a little bit of conversation with the guest then open for questions a little bit of conversations open and alternate because what i want to avoid is that somebody gets an amazing idea for a question minute two and then they sit there for two hours constipated with this question, unable to ask and not listening at all because you can't do two things at the same time. So we try to ensure that there's a fluidity to it. Um, a good thing about conversations uh, is it doesn't exist. We create it every second of the way. Um, and so you want to you want to give space for creativity that you don't really know where it's going. An intern tax salon doesn't have a goal. It's not an essay. You're not, you don't have to arrive at a point. You start it and you don't really know where it's going to go. Um, and I think there is, there's a lot of things to celebrate about that. Um, and I, I don't know if you read uh, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and Wen Grau. Um, mm-hmm. One of the, I mean, you read, you read everything, of course. You've read it multiple times. Um, I, one, of, one of the best pieces of information in this book is actually in the footnotes because Footnotes are, you know, where the good things um, are in a book. Um, and so skipping them is a crime. Um, the, they, they, they cite a, re- a piece of research where they say that if the, the human mind can hold a thought for seven seconds. But if you're conversing about it, infinitely. Exactly. So you can have a, you know, marriage is a multi-decade conversation, right? And you never really forget <laughs> what it's about so or a friendship right you, you keep you keep uh, uh, kind of chewing on the same mystery of life together um and so i always like to have people uh in at least my salons and that's my choice to to, to celebrate the not knowing where it's going mess of it um and and allow people um that freedom and and to enjoy the freedom. what have been some of the most um interesting to you Places where a salon where you thought it was going to go one way, 
But because of the format, it went a completely different way. Yeah. Tell us about a couple. Of, tell us about a couple of those. I, oh my god, I really, really loved having Kelly's super salon. We had two fantastic um, hosts, Ashley Zhang and Paul Miller, whom you know so well. Um, and we were so prepared. We did so much groundwork. And then Kevin came in and he was like, no, I don't want to talk about myself. I'm here to learn from the audience. And his that entire salon is him interviewing people about the wildest things. I mean, it was amazing, like World of Warcraft and book everything. That, like, he is so genuinely passionate about it. Esther Perel is similar. Esther Perel came to our event. And, you know, when you have a star, you're kind of, you know, you're prepared for everything. Anything can happen, right? You want it, the, the person to have an amazing experience and you don't really know who shows up, right? You have an idea from a parasocial point of view, having familiarized yourself with their work, and then you will have sometimes a completely different experience when the person actually shows up. And that's completely fine and it's part of the territory and you have to have the intellectual humility to, to, to work around it. Um, but Esther shows up and she's a gazillion times more awesome than even in her public work which is already extremely good. So it's kind of unfair to the, for the rest of us. Um, and, and she was like that, that throughout the entire event, and it was super hot, the, the heating got messed up in the building. Um, there were too many people. We ran out of wine, which is a huge you know, hosting mistake from my end, or just really hardcore job from our community um, to outdrink us. Um, and Esther spent, you know, spent basically... The seven hours she spent with us just talking to people, every single person. And I was like, wow, that's why she's Esther Burrell. You can't fake the interest in people and the unending, insatiable curiosity that you have. Insatiable, insatiable, anyway, heart. Insatiable, insatiable would be the um, American or Brit way of saying it. Curiosity about how people work. And... The downside of, of this for me, um, and I just had a conversation about somebody um, today, that you can spot fakers so well. And if you really spend your time constantly diving into the intellectual, you know, richness of the world, when somebody has a dark intention or is faking, you see it and it's sad and you cannot unsee it and you can't do anything when other people like this person or these ideas, I first of all, I don't think it's my place also to attack people, but it's a very uncomfortable knowledge, a piece of knowledge. And maybe it's, you know, when you can catch the vases, it's even sadder when you can't do it for some other reason. Um, the, probably the, you the, can, the, and you should see my that, WhatsApp. But that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that's an interesting thought, though, uh, because like, one of the things that we seem exposed to uh, much more because of social media, because of all these various things going yeah. on, are grifters and people who are fake. And, and it reminds me of Peter Drucker's uh, memoirs of a, a bystander, which is, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Because he just talks about the various interesting people in his life and kind of what yeah. he learned uh, about yeah. from from them. and. And he worked for a time, I think in the 1930s, at a merchant banker in London. And uh, Ernest Friedberg, I think, was the name of the founding partner. And he was, a, he was just such a fascinating character. But one of the things that he recounts in the memoir, Drucker, is that all of the younger people wanted to invest in this guy who had a scheme. And like his scheme was oversubscribed by the city in London. Everybody was like a point of pride to be able Which to be... Which means nothing, right? It means nothing. <laughs> exactly. If anything, because... it's like a first signal. Yes, exactly, right? What, what, what did uh, Twain... I think it was Twain. When you find yourself... It might have been Twain or Macon. When you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Uh, but Stop. anyway... Yeah, to, to, I mean, I don't know if you saw my tweet that I'm getting canceled for now, which is how much I hate uh, Norman Rush's book Mating, and I added into my tweet that, but everybody seems to like it, so I must be right. Ah, I didn't see that. I love that. Exactly, but I think I know I'm right. I have a lot of false positives about people. I never have a false negative, 
and I should be running a blog about it. How I signal is you can tell, I think, from how much I talk about certain people positively and how much I work with them, how much I promote their work so that other people can get acquainted with it um, and who I'm not talking about. And you can make your own assumptions based on that. Do you think I don't know about them or do you think I don't like them? I, I love that. And you're like me. I always try to find things to root for as opposed yeah. to against. Let me finish the story about yeah, yeah, Drucker, though, because, 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 be, be, <laughs> because, because it was really a great uh, tell for me. Anyway, Ernest Friedberg, all the yep. young guys and want to invest in this thing. He comes in, interviews the guy, and when the guy leaves, he turns to the young guys and says, we are absolutely not giving any money to that man. He is a crook. And they're like, what? What do you mean? He, what do you mean he's a crook? He's like, this is the, everyone said this. This is incredible. And Friedberg says, he came here with an answer for every conceivable question I could have asked him. And he said, an honest man wouldn't have to do that. An honest man would have told me, I don't know, a yeah. couple of times. I really yeah. thought about that for a long time. Like, yeah. that's really an interesting tell. What do you think? I think the more you know, the less confident you will be about some stuff because you understand statistics and the general chaos of things better. I also think that there is an inherently almost evil, uh, e evil, you know, quality to reduction. Being stuck, being backward, being dark, wanting less of things, less progress, less children, less life, less less light. I it's very rarely, you know, leading to to any good place. The other like flagging system I have, and it's very rarely really, really wrong, is people who seem to have a fascination with mess hypnosis and who write about them, who study them, who, who take pride in knowing about certain stuff um, in that area, um, and not from a scientific, you know, e economics way. Like, if you're interested in that from a game theoretical point of view, be my guest, right? But people who have a kind of religious fascination with secular religious things will at some point do it. I think there is, I think there's, um, there's a level of knowledge about power that will go in almost all cases from theoretical to practical, at least on the media level. I think one of one of the the examples that I have in the name of truthfulness is, is probably Jordan Peterson, right? I mean, he was such a fascinating speaker. If you watch his old videos, um, you know, on YouTube, a Jungian, somebody reminding me of my old professors a lot. Clearly, a very very talented scholar of human nature. But when you become a scholar of the mass level of human nature, will you will you be able to resist the temptation of trying it? Say, you know it, you know the recipe, and I give you a Twitter account. What will you do with it? Um, I, I, I do think it's not necessarily deterministic, but if you kind of reverse engineer, you do see the sign of this fascination. And so when I see, you know, if an engineer tweets about the power broker, I will concede that he, he's probably a good capitalist. Um, but if it's something more Machiavellian, um, you know, if you read uh, some of the classics and decide to just get very rich and then give a lot of money away for people, um, um, I will have follow-up questions to ask. Um, I will ask that if I gave that uh, mechanism you built to an evil person, what would they do with it? Yeah, that that that's one of the classic uh, things when you're trying to decide on some social policy and where you're going to land on it. Yeah. It, it, the question I always ask myself is, what would happen if this fell into the hands of my worst enemy yeah. or the the type of person that like you talk about Club of Rome, the Malthusians yeah. like and, and you know, there's a, there's this whole field in psychology that studies the dark triad personality and and Which like, I'm a little bit on the fence about. But yes, mm. <laughs> a lot of people I, I, study I, that, I think, are. Searching themselves, let's put it that way. But yeah, 
Well, yeah, that's Anthony DeMello, right? Like the, you could the, choose the, anything. You could choose any field. Why does this interest you so much? Is always my my question. That, but if that, you know, I love interintellect. Like, like you gave interintellect to an evil dictator, and everybody would leave. What? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not going to work. It, it's built on grace and 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 friendship and the infinite game. Right? If you're starting doing something harsh in it or dark or or self-destructive, even if it was masquerading as good, people would just feel uneasy and they don't come to interintellect for feeling uneasy. They come uh, to feel complete. That's a really interesting thought. Um, and it reminds me of, uh, the, I've been banging on about this book since so rereading it, uh, Hawkins, Power vs. Force. Oh, and, I don't know. And, and, and he maintains that and he, and again, it, it's really interesting on a couple of levels. So, for example, I think he picked the wrong word, power. He, mm. by, by, by that, we, we all have that label, right? And that's stuck in our... And power isn't necessarily a positive word to many people. And But he uses it in the sense that for most of human history, society was ruled by force. It was, yes. it was ruled by the end of the barrel of a gun. Yeah. And and he was talking in the book about how he sees a oh. new age coming and he wrote it a while back. So yeah. very prescient of him. But from a, he, he goes into the forest and he's basically this is an impoverished worldview. This is a view of scarcity. This is a view of no no net gains right through innovation, through new discoveries, et cetera. And, you know, it's a fixed pie mentality and they want to get their big portion of the pie. So they're going to force you. And if they're armed, they're really going to take a bigger portion of the pie. But then he talks about power. And by power, he means influence. He means giving people ideas to think about. And what strikes in me as I was listening to you. Very Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese way of thinking about power, right? It's exactly. And very reson it resonates very deeply with uh Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, and yeah. and but that that's a really great aspect of the salon. If I, if you did put like the worst dictator in the world, everyone just go, yeah, see ya, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, we never really have evil dictators in Indian salon, so I really intend to keep our moderation rules this way. Um, but if we ever feel um, that somebody has an ulterior motive with their event. I think people flag it and they will send a one star review like this sucked. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I just love that. And the same goes for good, right? I, I define good as the comfortable temperature for the soul. When it's good, mm, the soul I love comes that. out to play. And when it's bad, you hide it, right? Um, and sometimes we have a complete newcomer with zero audience, zero influence. And hosts, you know, to build a community, to play with ideas. Yeah, of course, he or she makes money. That's a nice plus. You want value to be generated if somebody is doing a good job. And people love it. And they will come back and they will raise this person on their metaphorical shoulders. And, you know, good content makes people a little bit selfish. They want more of it, right? They will come back and they will be like, hey, we really like that cake you made last week. And we are demanding that you bake it this week as well. And I, I just, I always wanted to build something that interacts not in a B2B way with some, you know, overworked HR manager, but directly with the audience. Um, because they tell me if something sucks or if they want more of something. Um, and, you know, it's not always comfortable for um, for our hosts. Um, the same way as if you're a Substack writer and you write something that's not interesting or not well promoted, people might not read it at numbers that you want it's it's kind of meritocratic and you have to put in the work um you have to find out what works and make more of it that's fascinating because as you get better known and as the salons are better attended how do you avoid audience capture right because like if everyone's giving you great feedback and you know it's these five themes, these 10 themes, whatever, that people just seem to love and can't get enough of, there's always that worry for all of us, because we're all running human OS, right? Like, oh, I'm going to lead into those 10 themes 
And yeah. then we subconsciously just like nudge those other ones off the table and say, yeah, we're not doing those anymore. So we see, for instance, people running their own shows or their own series um, that they experiment with other topics outside the series. So say you run a series on, I don't know, religion or philosophy, and then you will do one on toy making um, and see what happens. Um, or you say, I'm running this biology-themed series of workshops, but I'm going to do a super salon with this celebrity who has a book coming out or a Netflix documentary coming out on the side to see if, if the audience would be interested in that. Uh, there's also a great power to partnerships here. Um, a lot of people find a co-host to be able to deviate a little bit from uh, their most popular topics. Um, but I very rarely have seen a host really stuck in one thing. You might have somebody like, you know, the great Jason Crawford, who is obviously a progress studies person um but even his you know different the series the super salon the host training workshop he did for us you know he he ex experiments um i think that people come to interinteract whether that's you know an offline event like the one that we will do on the 30th of april uh where you know maybe a more political um a uh, thinker will come to really just talk about books and ideas and the mechanism of it, um, or a traditional publishing house uh, executive will come because he or she wants to talk more about trade presses or um, the technological future of, of book creation. Um, or an Esther Perel comes to us because she wants to have a philosophical conversation with philosophers that she doesn't always get to do. Um, and so we do think that people come to Interintellect to celebrate their own diversity of thought. Um, there are so many places where you can remain in your silo and just do the same thing on road. You know, the entire content machinery of algorithm-driven internet um, is forcing you to do that, right? I remember there was a moment in my career in maybe late 2018 when I, I felt the algorithm almost physically trying to force me to be this contrarian, attacking Twitter kind of person, the contrarian woman, you know, who debunks other people. And I felt that, you know, when I, if I tried, you know, the, the whole machinery started working. And then you make this decision, do I want to be that person? Is it worth it? Or do I want to do my own thing, even if I stay smaller? And then... I think the ethical way is to stay smaller and trust the process. Um, but I can understand the temptation that if you are a person who really immediately has to spread his or her ideas to a very wide audience, you might say, I'm just going to boost up my audience with whatever means first, and then I will be good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's possible, but you have to be very conscious of the process, very careful, and we do see some really beautiful work there. I mean, you have a gigantic account, right? And what you do with it is sharing philosophy with people, um, showing these guys the way that you can actually entertain a lot of people with smart ideas, um, even if you, I don't know, if you grew your uh, your um, audience with some polarized content in the past five years. Yeah. For a guy who basically made his career on algorithmic investing, I... I, uh, yeah. I <laughs> You've had enough. We're like, okay, enough of this. I'm, I exactly. I I, I I I love to fuck around with the algorithm. So I will, and and I know how too, which is really um, fun. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm starting to develop this kind of Casablanca lighting. You know, very film noir. Half of my face in darkness, and then the eyes blinking. Um, maybe not the not ideal for YouTube. Uh, we'll see how it turns out. <laughs> You almost got me to do a uh, digression into Casablanca because I you love do. that movie. Do that. <laughs> I, I was so happy that Tyler Cohen uh, recently wrote about it. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about Casablanca. Uh, we should do a, a podcast episode just about that. We should invite Tyler. Yeah, that would be great. I, though, I was lucky because when I was growing up, my dad was a real movie buff. And, and just as VHS was coming out, right? It, uh, I'm old <laughs> because I was a teenager back when that was happening. Um, 
my dad, I'm like, well, like, what movies should I watch that? And he took the time to like create this massive list. Yeah. Almost all of them were in black and white. Casablanca was definitely there, but All About Eve was there. You know. And like, these were fucking great movies. And, yeah. you know, I, I hate to just see them as memes or gifts now, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think maybe a, a, a podcast just about some of those great old movies would be great. I mean, I used to be a screenwriter, um, and I did take the Robert McKee seminar at some point, and his big examples throughout the three-course seminar is Casablanca. So you actually have it on a screen behind him, and you watch it through three uh, days, frame by frame, basically, and you analyze. Um, and he uses it as a framing device, basically, pun, pun, um, to, to teach you about screenwriting. Because Casablanca is one of the kind of, you know, exemplary, pure forms of the genre. Um, and, and whilst you're there, you realize that this is a masterpiece. It's mm. extremely distilled, simple, and yet it talks about the greatest problems of, of, of human life. Right, and then you watch three, four hours horrible Netflix nonsense, and there's not a you know a flicker of of hu humanness in it that you can resonate to. And you're like, who are these people? Who what, exactly. have, have they met a human in their life? <laughs> this is not what people do. And and I and I don't I, I don't think it's cancel culture actually. I think cancel culture had led to weird things like if you want to show people you know, of scheming and fucking around, you have to have dragons yeah. in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's it's a, an advertising agency in the 60s, and then you can show how people are. Um, but I think that's maybe a little bit gone, and now we have just, to me, seeming like filmmakers who are not, who were not raised on the classics. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What? Yeah, and I, you should. I, if you haven't read Dostoevsky, you should not, <laughs> do film dramas. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's my that's yeah. my entry fee. Like if you can follow a conversation about brothers Karamazov, you can do a, a movie about a family. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, every every happy family is the same, and every unhappy family is unique in their own way, right? Yeah, but it might it might be the other way around, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But happiness that has the secrets that nobody hey, knows. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I've got to be careful here because we, if I digress too much, we're just going to make this all about movies. And we'll have, yeah. This podcast episode will come with like a super long table of contents and then you switch <laughs> wherever you want. Okay. <laughs> like minute 40, we will talk about classical music and minute 41 about Super Mario and minute 42 about <laughs> Hitchcock. Choose your own adventure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's wow. Okay. So Hitchcock, like there's another guy, right? <laughs> like, oh my God. Like I've seen, I think I've seen every movie that I ever made. Mm -hmm. And, and there's this dissonance in me because he was not a good guy. He was like, he, he had a lot back to dark triad, right? <laughs> yeah. He had a lot of those. But what he got out of his actors was just, like, amazing. Incredible. And this also goes back to this idea of license. And, you know, at the beginning uh, of this conversation, we were talking about, you know, people who think that they can contribute and how dare they, you know. And when people get stuck, whether they are trying to write a, a book or they mm -hmm. are trying to find investors they might ask themselves you know who, who, do, who do who do i think i am and and i think what makes you become this determined person facing difficulties that you and i both um uh, confess to is a little bit being able to put aside this question eric weinstein said this thing i don't know what i'm only quoting like idw people today which actually has nothing to do with my general um you know quotables um, but he 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 was quoting, I think, Francis Crick in an interview many, many years ago. Um, what would he say, you know, to people who, who think they are not big or important or smart enough to do great things? Um, and and Crick apparently in in, in Weinstein's um uh, a quote said that 
great things are greater than anybody. Yeah. Nobody is great enough to do them. That by default, it doesn't matter. Like our, you know, the deviation of human size is tiny compared to this big thing. It doesn't matter. Right. Just do it. Somebody has to do it. Um, and I think people who somehow have this delusion that they have license to do great things, or at least to try, they, I don't think that, I mean, unless you're a psychopath, you, you, you are not necessarily driven by hubris. You are driven by the weird and strange realization that anybody could do it. It's going to be equally super difficult for everybody. Are you happy with living your life in a super difficult way? Right. And, and to me, that's that being able to put aside is the same at, at like running a big event. When you are running, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, and, and I'm not saying like this is not, you know, having low self-confidence or not having a strong enough sense of self. It's you you need to be able to put aside yourself for the task, whatever that is, whether that's listening to somebody building a big company, running a big artistic project, building a beautiful family, you know, know when to silence the inner quarrel uh, to be able to get the job done. Yeah. I, uh, one thing that helped me a lot was realizing kind of early on that I am at best a co-creator, a co-investigator, uh, and that you know, I also think that there's a big difference between having a when when people say, oh, that person has a big ego. I think what they really mean is that person has a fragile ego. Yeah. Fragile egos demand like I was reading about narcissists uh, before we started. And yeah. like like the, the the narcissistic person is basically look at me look at me and and to me that is much more a sign of a fragile mm. sense of self a fragile ego they're the ones demanding everyone pay pay attention to me pay attention to me yeah, so scared that if i let anybody co-create with me i will lose myself or i will not seem as good huh yeah i mean first of all i think that everybody's a co-creator Right. If you, I agree. I think in that career, there is a whole startup in the background, right? Um, and but the people who claim to be alone, that's where you feel this. Mm -hmm. You know why? Yeah. I think you and I discussed it. I mean, I don't know if it was at the podcast last time we did, um, or, or a salon, but I, I love this quote about FDR that he was the true egoist, he was never threatened by anybody, and so he could hire the best people and win World War II. Exactly. Exactly. And in, in every photo, MDR is with other people. He's always in the car. Sometimes it's Stalin, you know, so not always good, but, you know, <laughs> right. he, he, was, he, had a, he had a group and then he just took credit for everybody's ideas. But there was, there's something to being able to, to both mentor other people and ensure that there is a next generation. Mm. And not die without having passed on, not trying to live forever yourself, but mm. be able to check out at some point and ensure that the next generation is all right, that you have passed on your knowledge, that you have supported, enabled, helped aspire a, a large group of people. Um, and to be able to, you know, hold your friends in the photo and be like, we built this together. Yeah. People always know who's the mastermind. If you are a mastermind, you don't have to say it. Exactly. <laughs> it's like the joke. If you have visionary in your profile, you ate one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see this guy who is whining on Twitter that he can't date because he's too thoughtful, too romantic? I did. I did. And that he has empath in, your, in his bio? <laughs> and I'm like, this guy must be an evil genius. <laughs> He suddenly, like, you know, um, mo mobilized all the 15 year olds pro of TikTok, probably. Um, <laughs> like, I can't help him. <laughs> it's like the job interview equivalent, you know, would be like, what's your biggest flaw? I work too hard. <laughs> Always. 
Always. <laughs> yeah. It's not on as this person is, right? That you're owning up to this difficult truth about yourself. I, 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 I just can't. Uh, I, I, I have no work-life balance, and, and I just will give everything to the company. That's yeah. my greatest flaw. Here's my sleeping bag. I will sleep there. <laughs> no. I love hiring people who have a life, you know, for themselves, whether that's an artistic life, a family life, or a combination thereof, they will, they will make, uh, they will prove the, the adage that if you want something done, give it to a busy person. One of my most productive uh, team members at Interintellect is a young mom. She sometimes has like one and a half hours to get something done because the baby is asleep and she gets it done. Like making me feel so unproductive. <laughs> like wow, she. I, yeah. Anyway, so I'm sure you you have much more experience uh, in uh, 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 at that, that than myself. But it's something that I, I I keep realizing as being very true. Well, let's talk about that for a bit. I mean, you have been hiring new people uh, because uh, the company is doing well and expanding. Like, w- what are you learning as you're doing it? A lot. I think every um, boss, uh, after two years of running a company with employees, should be given a PhD in social psychology. Um, I guarantee you we know way more about this than any scholar. Um, A lot of startup um, kind of fridge magnets are turning to be untrue. Uh, One being this one that hire for character, train for skill, I think is not true. I think if you hire somebody who doesn't have the skill, um, his or her character will change and will show their less good side. Um, I think skill leads to moral excellence as well in a very Aristotelian way. You can be, you can feel useful and you can be proud of yourself. You can be given responsibilities. So that's very, very important. Um, I also recently have changed my mind a little bit about delegation. Um, I think you know, um, investors will always say, delegate, delegate, delegate. Um, and I'm finding it that that's not always true. And no. maybe it's a more a collaborative approach that we should be pushing. Delegate as in involve others in it, but don't leave the room. Mm. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I had never been as vulnerable as a startup founder in the past four years as I was now with my, you know, dad dying and then passing. Um, and it was, you know, a bit of a revealing two weeks um, period uh, where you do find out what is not working in your organization. But that was an extreme level of delegation. That you don't normally do this, right? You are not normally both emotionally and intellectually unavailable for stretches of the day. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I I think I've, I'm becoming more and more cautious with a lot of the startup uh, wisdoms. Um, and I rather ask people like yourself, people who have built companies for actual practical wisdom, uh, which like in Esther Perel's work is so often that it depends. Yeah. With some people, yeah. the best is to delegate. With other people, no. Yeah. And some- and that's part that's part of your what you're understanding about uh getting a better understanding of human OS, right? Yeah. Because in the in the in the in the real world, it's like the old joke, the two bankers sitting together, right? And and the one says to the other, well, we know it works in reality. We just don't think it's going to work in theory. <laughs> I love this. I, lo- I, I actually quote this. I think you tweeted this and I, I just laughed my head off. That's so good. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in moral excellence. I think I generally um, believe in, in goodness and, and that it overrides all other qualities at the end of the day. Um, I think it's very easy to miss it or mistake it for something else and the other way around as well. Um, the, the smartest, most productive and most successful people at my company, um, who are making me also more successful, smarter, more efficient are extremely good people. Yeah. And that also gets you know, back you just to can't argue with it. You know, it's like, so I know it's like a, such an old fashioned thing and, you know, we want to not think this way. We want to think about like trauma and childhood and self-care and healing and a lot no, it's about the morality of this person. There is such a thing. Yeah. And um, a- as far as that goes, I've also found that like 
building the team is very delicate because to your point about delegation, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I a believer in delegation, uh, in terms of soliciting opinions about the way to do things. So I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm a huge believer as anyone who listened to this podcast uh, is that like life is a complex adaptive system and in complex adaptive systems, emergence comes from below, not from above. <laughs> and yet we often try to manage so many things from top down. Yep. And and one of the things that I learned early on in the various companies I started was I always wanted to push uh, uh, ideas and um, uh, actual decisions down to the people who are actually the greatest domain knowledge about it, right? So for an example, um, when, when I started O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, an, another and I'd started my first asset management, which was O'Shaughnessy Capital. But one of the things that I'd learned between the two, when I did O'Shaughnessy Capital, I was kind of a tyrant, honestly. It was like, no, you no, have, no, you we're going to- have your tyrant face. You have to have your puberty as a boss. Yes, you really if you do. Have, if I meet a boss who hasn't had hers yet, I'm like, you, we are pre-grade filter. Call me in 10 years. I don't want to go through this with you. Good luck. <laughs> Sometimes take my money. Poor current employees that you have, poor your family, your friends, this is going to be rough. It's the same as famous people, right? I mean, people desire to become famous and then they realize that nobody has ever been improved by fame. And whatever moment to quote Taylor Swift, fame finds you, you will be stuck there forever unless you really make a conscious effort to, to stop doing that. And it's, it's the same with, you know, people... If you experience somebody going through their political phase, their their fame re related phase, or their tyrant phase, it's you know it's part of the evolution of personalities, and you just a good friend waits it out. Yeah, just that's not, that's great know, advice. And I, I use that friend, like tries to stop you from being stuck there because you can be stuck in it, right? It can become a permanent thing, but there's nothing to do. Fail fast, right? Fail fast. Right, and uh, one of the one of the things uh, I'm that clapping on the on a podcast, but you know I'm Hungarian, so I have these insane gestures all the time, and this just happens. <laughs> we all have these things, our muscles, because we just gesture all day. I even gesture <laughs> for myself when I'm at home alone. That's a whole different thing, but yeah, and it's, <laughs> and it's kind of like I, I, I learned not to wear like jingling um, uh, 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 bracelets uh, on podcasts, and not to like clap and do weird things with my hands. Uh, so, but if I do, please just tell me to stop. <laughs> I mean, I have, that reminds me of a joke. Uh, I have a very good friend who was born and raised in New York. And when I moved here, we were out together. He's hysterically funny. And when I moved here, he's like, you, Jim, you know, you, you sound like all the fucking newscasters. And he goes, <laughs> We we, we 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 talk we we talk with our hands here in New York, and he, he's like, "But Jim, one thing that most people don't realize is that if we put our hands on the table, we sound just like you." <laughs> I love it. Oh my god, that's so interesting. Yeah, I I think my my accents and, and generally my 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 verbal expression can be a little bit like a zealic situation. Like I just pick up you know, anybody's that I'm talking with because this is not my mother tongue, right? So I don't have a default accent myself. But the one thing I would never get rid of is the gestures. And even when I had a more British accent because I, I was in the middle of, you know, my seven-year stint in London, I was still gesturing like a crazy person. And people could tell by looking at me that I'm probably not posh. <laughs> you know, probably the this idea, you, is you, not you, posh. You, you 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 bring up Zelig though, which is a chameleon like thing, and and I have a, a friend who uh, is Japanese and uh, grew up in Japan, et cetera, but then moved and was living in London and elsewhere. Yeah, and we were having a conversation, and he said something really interesting to me, and he said, "I I had said something, you know, like no, we've got to do this, this, and this, right? Like, and and he just looks at me and he goes." You know what, Jim? When I'm speaking and thinking in Japanese, I'm a lot like you. 
<laughs> yeah, because you have different. Yeah, you have you have different different personalities in different languages. Hmm. Do, do you find bit. that? Do you find that? I used to think so. Now much less. What I think happens is speaking a different language unlocks parts of your brain. Like it's, English is a very logical language. You have to be extremely aware of what you're going to say and whether what kind of you know emotional tint uh, or emphasis that thing might have, which is not necessarily the case in Hungarian and definitely not the case in French um, or German, for as far as I know. Uh, so English, I think, makes you a little bit more logical, um, and I can see how I use Hungarian now that I'm more aware of where my sentences have to be going before I start speaking. In German, actually, it's even more so if you think about how they put in many in many uh, uh, types of, of sentences the verb at the end of the sentence. So when I was watching Arrival, where the aliens know where they are going in the future before they start speaking, I was like, that's just German. What are you talking about? You don't <laughs> even- <laughs> have you heard of Transports? You know, it's a very nice... Yep. Nice river. Um, anyway, so so I, I, I believe in that. Um, but that sounds... I do think that there is a level of passion that can get lost in English unless you're very, very good at expressing it. Because I find that in French, I'm, I'm far more... Um, I'm far more able to, to show emotion fast. Actually, it's a very emotive language. So it's very hard to create a very rational-looking French sentence, which you know you can tell by just like looking at their culture um, or reading a book. Um, in Hungarian, I that Hungarian to me seems very psychologically analytical. So whatever you do, you kind of make assumptions and go into the motivations of the other speaker. Um, so I do feel a little bit more relaxed and more outward looking and extroverted in English and living my life basically in English. Um, but when you speak multiple languages, you have all those, you know, parts of you, the same way as when you play both the violin and the piano, you will express, even if you're playing the same sheet music, you will express different parts of yourself through these different instruments. Um, and neither is more true than the other, right? It's just a different way of going about it. Yeah, we are publishing a book uh, at Infinite Books later this year called White Mirror. And it's a collection of stories, uh, science fiction, uh, uh, but not not dystopic science fiction. Uh, science fiction with, with, a, with, a li- with a little bit of uh, a, a brighter look at the future. But one of his stories is really interesting because it considers uh, a uh, physicist or a computer scientist who goes into the the deepest parts of a very remote jungle to learn a language that very few people speak because he needs to learn it to think of a solution for the problem that he's working on and he can't he can't think of the solution in his native language which is English oh, um, I can't count in English I can only count in Hungarian um, and, and I read this uh, French website it's called Stens la Duan who writes um, about this, and he wrote a book called uh, The Number Sense in English, it's called, uh, because I noticed that English language doesn't penetrate the part of my brain where my my numeric skills are. So if you ask me my phone number in English, I will have to visualize it and read it up. Mm-hmm. I can't go even where the numeric um, a memory um, is. Um, and the same goes a little bit for like physical formulae and things like that, but that where basically letters standing for numbers, like if I want to say F equals M times A, I have to really slow down because I have to read up something that appears in my visual memory. Whereas in Hungarian, I can just say F, like it comes from some deeper part. Um, but then there are, you know, things where, especially with, when it comes to like planning, I think it's in English is much easier to plan with. Like it's yeah. much more cool. like I can tell you how something is going to work, whether that's my business plan or an event or the outline of a book. Like it's much closer to um, kind of painting with words because yeah. it's this isolating language, right? Like you spit out this short, you know, syllable is not short, but these short words, right? And they 
kind of forge some kind of architecture. Um, you know, if you give me a, an English nonfiction book, even the most eloquent ones, I will read it and I will immediately understand the structure and see the notes from which the writer wrote them. And this is why, you know, a lot of uh, university assignments seem such a, <laughs> so ludicrous to me because you basically give me a book to reproduce the notes that the writer wrote this from. Makes no sense. But if you gave me a French or a Hungarian book from an equally logical author, um, I would have a harder time seeing the kind of magic eye image in the background um, that the English language allows me to say, the, the structure. And, you know, that's the idea of lost in translation. Remember when we were talking about the book that oh, I yeah. love, the Hungarian Amber? <laughs> you have to Amber. drink all the whiskey like this since then on. <laughs> if it's hard to put up your face, um, <laughs> with, then you really like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are you most excited about right now uh, uh, in terms of uh, your career and about anything, honestly? What, what are you most excited about right now and looking forward to? I am very excited to be moving to the U.S. very soon. Um, and I've been in the last couple of months feeling the weight of the loneliness of not being there. Um, I was always a little bit more balanced about it, um, enjoyed my more introverted life in Europe, and then I would go and get hyper-social in the U.S. I'm very enthusiastic right now to develop a more holistic life there and spend more time there, both downtime and uptime. Um, I, at some point in the next two years, will write a book, uh, called Intellectual Orphans. Um, I will pitch it to you. Don't worry. It's, uh, it's going to say, <laughs> uh, I also run a company full time as a solo founder of a 12 employees. So there's also that little thing. Um, and I'm very excited for where internet is right now. Um, we have a new, um, website platform coming out very, very shortly, uh, which will have the structure of our current site, but in a much better way, um, much you know, better features and and more more ergonomical, um, especially because our current site is not ergonomical at all. So the bar was really low. Um, one of my favorite artists, Julien Paco, uh, created the artwork, and it's going to look really pretty. Um, and we also have a special um, little product that we are prototyping on the site um, that you know all about. Um, and at some point, I will uh, tell the public. Um, which will, I hope, enable a radically bigger amount of people to enjoy what Interintag does um, and be able to participate however actively they want in a given moment. Um, I am very, very excited. I'm very, you know, it's very exhausting, fulfilling but exhausting. Um, and I think, you know, we were talking about the practical wisdoms of leaders. I think one is also being very honest about it with your team. Um, I always tell my team when it's going to be rough, get your shit together, guys. It's going to be very enjoyable. You will make best friends on this team while you're doing it. Uh, afterwards, we will go to a spa, you know, everybody in their own location. But right now, this is war mode. Um, and the way to do it is to enjoy every second of it. Yeah. And the the uh, project that you're uh, alluding to is very very exciting, and I can only wait until you start talking about that openly. When, when you, I hope people will uh, like it. You know, we, we, this is like, hey guys, this is what we think you will like, um, and then you you know release it into the wild and and start learning. Um, we don't exactly. Know. Yeah, exactly. When 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 you were contemplating moving to the United States, which which area drew you the most intuitively just knowing you i know the answer but i want uh, you to share the i want to want you to share the answer with our listeners viewers and for a very long time i thought i would have to go to sf i thought that you know if you're a startup founder you have to be in sf and i have to get a lululemon pair of pants and patagonia vest and a dog and a very large uh, cappuccino and walk around and look smart um and then i realized like there are plenty of people already doing this <laughs> Uh, I, I'm good. Um, don't get me wrong. I love California. I don't think I ever would want to live there, um, but I'm very happy for people who are having a great time there, um, and I wish them the best of luck. Um, and I don't know. I, I feel like New York kind of discovered me. I was very resistant for a very long time. Um, 
Uh, and I always thought, like, why would why would a place that has everything culturally want interact? Like, we should take this to a village. Um, but you know, there's a reason why New York is New York, and it's greedy for good stuff. And we have the good stuff. So it seems to be a very fertile ground for, for us. Um, I also really, really deeply love D.C. Um, and try to go there as often as I can. I mean, the the beauty of the city, the culture, people, the kind of conversations you can have there. I'm going there in um, late April as well. Um, it's just, you know, if I ever you know, want a calmer place, I, I might probably go um, uh, somewhere in Virginia. It's just, that's my favorite landscape um, that I, where I can imagine myself. It's just so beautiful. Architecturally yeah. in like the natural sense. So New York to me is an idea, not not just a city. And I, I love the illusion that's that you just made that. Yeah, and yeah. every idea, right? And when people don't feel comfortable in a, that's why I was. I always felt so out of place in London, and I think it's because I don't like the idea. Yeah, and, and not and, I hate the idea. It's not that I don't like it, like a polite way. I hate that idea. I don't want to be there. Other than two days a, a year, that's great. But some people love it. You know, I don't know. It's a queer yeah. Episode. yeah. New York, I, I knew uh, when when I first came to New York, I was eight years old uh, and we were heading over to Ireland to live for a summer. Um, and uh, I, uh, this is 1968, uh, New York was kind of experiencing a rough patch then. But uh, I got up and put on my little white windbreaker and went for a three hour exploration of New York. Not telling mom and dad, of course. That's the song, The Boxer. You are the boxer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the yeah. Guy boxer. And so, and so I, I come back into the hotel and there's cops everywhere. I see my mom sitting on, on one of the central couches weeping because she thinks I've been kidnapped. I didn't tell her that I was doing this. And and I run over to her and I don't remember this. She, I remember it. I think I remember it because she told me the story so many times. But she said, you come running over to me with this huge smile on your face, and you said to me, Mommy, I love this city. I'm going to live here. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same. I, I sleep so well in New York. I, I'm completely calm. I have feel like I, I don't have to run anywhere. I've arrived. I have this feeling there. But at the same time, I feel so, you know, a little bit self-conscious. Like, oh, my God, am I basic? <laughs> I like the song <laughs> that everybody else likes. This is, I, I want like a special city. Oh, that but but see, like yeah, no, but see, New, New, New York can be very, very uh, uh, controversial divisive. in that sense. Uh, it can be very divisive because I, I always said to people who were I coming like here, I arrived to Andorra and I feel at home. Like I want to be special, you know. It's exactly. I used to say to people though. You either feed on New York's energy or it feeds on you. And like, if you're one of those people who feeds on New York's energy, it's like, yeah. That's interesting because because it's not true about London because London just feeds on you. Like there's no other alternative. I always, I have this, um, I have two tests for cities that I always look at to kind of determine whether it's my kind of city or not. Why? Do I see happy people? And by happy, I mean socially happy people. Um, and when I went to um, uh, New York for the first time, I kept look. I, I understood immediately that this is dirty, loud, a little bit inhumane, too big, falling apart. You, you get all the, the the you know you get all that thing. Uh, but do I look around in any random location and see a couple of happy people? Right? You know, in India at the craziest airport where you're like sardines and you still see you know a husband taking the baby from the wife and, and holding her in new york in the craziest moment you will see two friends laughing a couple something you know something positive and the other thing is for me do people when they get rich stay yeah. And in London, when I started going, I mean, when I arrived to London, I was going through a very rough time uh, personally. And I, you know, I was very, very, you know, down and out. So I thought, okay, it sucks for me, but just wait. 
And then when I started going up, I started noticing that, first of all, in Brussels, when I lived there during the pandemic, I, for the 1,300 euros that I paid for my apartment there a month, I had more space, dry, warm, calm than a rich person in London. Nobody's ever physically comfortable in that city ever. Temperature, damp, wise, or having a place to sit down. Um, and then I, as I said, going up, I realized like the people who can afford, they leave. And then you're like, why am I busting my ass here? Like, is the, is the reward of London that you can leave? That's a prison. That sounds terrible. Um, but then you go to Paris or you go to New York and you see like, no, when people get successful, they get a really good apartment, <laughs> you know, and unless they have like seven kids, they will very likely for a very long time stick around. Um, and so I look at happy people and I look at what people who can choose do. Mm. And I think that's find out a lot about city, um, just looking at these two things. Yeah. And because the, because uh, you're doing Instagram, you don't even have to meet actual successful people in a new city anymore. You just Google, you know, I don't know, Detroit or München, like what do a cute guy and then some feed will come up and show you how they live. So it's good. Yeah. Foster. You can do it on the plane. <laughs> and and for uh, for our London uh, lovers out there, I do like London. Uh, but yeah, but uh, you like it, but you don't live there, right? People who like New York live in New York, and people who like London don't live there. Touche, touche. Sorry, well, I won't get I, I kicked out of the country or something for saying this. I'm sorry, uh, London. It's not your uh, fault. It's Dickens' fault because he told us all about you and now we can't unsee it. <laughs> Dickens was oh, like the... Dickens, well, Dickens was like one of the first rock stars, though. If you read about his life and he serialized his books, literally people would wait at the uh, port for the ship yeah. coming from London in, in New York because they, they wanted to... Yeah. What happened to Little Mel? Yeah. I mean, you can tell, you can always tell from a novel when it was written in an era of serialization, because yeah, in many, many cases, the writer had no idea what would happen in the next chapter. So it's much more interesting. Um, and secondly, there is always a kind of cliffhanger. Uh, one, one contemporary book that reminds me, uh, reminded me strongly was um, um, the Hunger Games trilogy, because it's written by a TV writer, Susan Collins. And every chapter ends with a cliffhanger, so I just didn't sleep for two days. <laughs> just, it's like insanely, like, it's one of the most full of suspense books that, that you can imagine. Sometimes serialization is a little bit more, you know, wider term, like, obviously the Harry Potter books were a series. Um, anyway, so we digress. We, that should be the title of this podcast episode, We Digress. And... You've just been given the title by Anna. We digress. <laughs> yeah, you know. We digress. Well, so uh, I, I, I could definitely talk to you forever, as we often do when we get together. But now I'm getting the hook from my nanny. Uh, I keep my phone nearby, and my nanny says, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so, children, so, please don't let me keep you. You get another shot at being Empress of the World. Remember, you can't put anyone in a re-education camp. You can't kill anybody. But what you can oh, do is we're going to give you... I know, I know. That's what other people say, too. It's like, God damn it. Those are going to be the two things I was going to do. So we are going to give you a magic microphone, and you are going to speak two things into it. That will incept all 8 billion people on the planet the next day, whenever their next day is, they're going to wake up and they're going to think that the two things that you're incepting, that they've had that idea on their own. Yeah. And this time they're going to actually act on it. what two things you're going to incept in the world. That the outside world is more interesting than you are and you should spend the majority of your time exploring it. Um, and making life beautiful for other people is more important than making it beautiful for yourself. Um, and you should devote yourself to it and hope that others will make yours beautiful too. Wow. That's almost like the golden rule. I love it. Well, 
Looking Learn the hard way, but then really beautifully summarize, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but that's the thing, right? That's why uh, that, that's why all of the uh, great quotes and great ideas they get compressed, compressed, it's, compressed, and you know, you you, you that, distill right? that wisdom exactly. Well, I can hardly wait to see you at our symposium that we are doing live. We'll do the Bill Riley joke. We'll do it live. Fuck it. We'll, we'll do, do it live. Live. <laughs> live from New York. It's Saturday afternoon, 13th of April. Be there. You you know I'm clipping that and <laughs> putting it up on social media. You know, I'm so sad to be on this podcast two days before I go to the hairdresser. Can you do something with my hair? Yeah, we'll oh, have the AI. We'll, we'll yeah, have the AI. Studio. We'll, yeah, we'll, have, we'll, we'll have the AI work it out for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just give me like a lot of locks or something. <laughs> All right, Anna. Gonna, as... I have purple hair on this podcast and I look like a Simpson. I will know that this was you good. <laughs> <laughs> I will not know that this was not know right. until we release it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, right. Jim. Everybody Thank you, has... Anna. All right. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye.